Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the latest of the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines presentations on Brexit. Uh, today's webinar is on rules of origin, and we are very kindly joined by our colleagues from Revenue. Uh, today's first presentation will be from Ray Ryan from Revenue. That will be followed by Kevin Foley Friel from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And there will be a Q&A session afterwards, which will include the two speakers and also some of Ray Ryan's colleagues from Revenue. So anything that you want to know, uh, put it into the question tab and we will try and get to as many as possible. Any of the ones we can't get to, you can contact uh, Revenue directly at brexitqueries at revenue.ie or you can contact uh, Agriculture at brexitcall at agriculture.gov.ie. So uh, without any further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker, Ray Ryan from Revenue. Thanks, Tom, and thanks for the opportunity to do a presentation here today on Origin. Um, just in relation to the presentation, it is quite technical, and I think it will be useful that it is recorded and available for people to go through. And um, my colleague, uh, Kevin from Department of Agriculture will go through a bit more kind of practical examples in the next presentation. So the presentation I'll go through is slightly technical and I'll try to make it as, as bearable as possible in, in terms of it and relate that to bring right back to your own products and your own goods. Uh, just in terms of the presentation itself, I'm just going to switch off my screen because I have issues with the um, reception at the moment. So hopefully there'll be no issues in the sound quality anyway. I'll switch back on for the Q&A again then. So just in terms of the, the contact details there, um, there is a direct line into the, the section itself. It's um, origin evaluation section at revenue.ie and the Brexit queries and if it's more general queries in relation to Brexit. So just in terms of the presentation itself, the presentation aims to give you a better understanding of the general concepts relating to rules of origin. So when we talk about rules of origin, what are we actually talking about? Well, in simple terms, it's the origin of the product means the nationality of the product. So just because I purchased a product from a supplier in the UK, that does not mean that the goods have originated in the UK. They may have been imported from China or the US and their origin is unlikely to have changed. You may wonder why this is important. The origin of the product is one of the factors that determine what rate of customs duty is paid and will be really important if a zero tariff agreement is reached between the EU and the UK. So only products that meet specific requirements of an FTA can qualify for that preferential duty rate which is how an FTA for zero duty between the UK, or sorry, between the EU and the UK will be considered. So as I mentioned, I'm not gonna make you uh, experts in rules of origin. It's just to cover some of the main principles around um, the rules of origin and some of the background, I suppose, terms and some of the, maybe some of the stuff you've heard in relation to rules of origin and explain some of the meanings of them. So these main principles are common among uh, different free trade agreements, but each free trade agreement will have specific requirements included. So these product specific rules vary according to the product, the country and the free trade agreement. So one thing is important to note is you can't assume that the rule for a certain product is the same for all partner countries with whom the EU has an FTA. So you need to check the rule for each country you're trading with. It's important to understand the rules of origin from both an importing and an exporting perspective. So the preferential duty rate is claimed by the importer, but it's the exporter who provides the information necessary to prove origin. So in recent agreements, uh, the exporters register in the REC system uh, in order to be able to declare the origin of the goods. And the only exemption from the requirement to prove origin is for non-trade movements. So for example, um, goods that travel in a personal baggage. Um, I just mentioned earlier that there are some provisions that are common to all free trade agreements, and these are listed on the slide. So when we talk about rules of origin, we talk about whether the product or material has originating status. And what we're trying to determine is whether the goods have wholly obtained or have sufficiently worked in order to qualify for the preferential treatment. Wholly obtained mainly applies to the products or natural products and goods made from, from them. So an easier way to think of this would be um, a cow born and reared in Ireland will always have an Irish and therefore EU origin. Similarly, any meat or product made from the cow will also have that EU origin. If a product or material is not wholly obtained, then it must be sufficiently worked or processed in one of the FTA countries in order to obtain origin. I'll give some examples of sufficient and insufficient working later in the presentation. There are also different types of accumulation depending on the type of agreement and number of parties involved, which we'll look at in more detail also later. And the concept of territoriality relates to where materials can be worked or processed. Normally this must be done in the territory of one of the FTA par partners, but there can be exceptions, um, especially when there's a value added, which is less than 10%. 
uh, just more terms in ter uh, sorry more details in terms of tunnel provisions so the direct transport means that the goods must either trans travel directly between the partner countries or under the customs transit procedure if moving through a non-partner co partner country and then in terms of to tolerance under the general tolerance rule the final product may still qualify for preferential treatment even if small amounts of the non-originating material have been used so two things to note here is that they may be by small amount we typically mean less than 10 percent and you cannot apply this general tolerance rule and derogation from the principle, principle of territoriality that we discussed in the last slide at the same time. So there's a lot of, I suppose, detail in relation to that and applying it to the, the relevant products. And some examples of the poorly obtained goods, so live animals bored or born or raised there, products from live animals raised there, mineral products or other living natural resources extracted or taken from there, and then vegetable plant, plant products harvested or gathered there. So you can see the, these are what would be considered obtained as wholly obtained goods, or sorry, origin as wholly obtained goods. Just in terms of sufficiently worked then, or the process products, um, some examples are, lying, are set out here. So if it's non-originating material that has been sufficiently worked, the main methods we consider are value added, so this is where the value of the non-originating material does not exceed a certain percentage of the X works price. That X works price is the combined cost of the material, the labor, overheads, and profit. So the percentage will be set out in the product-specific rule of the FTA concerned. And again, the different FTAs have different rules for the product, so you need to be aware of those. Specific processes may be set out in product-specific rule, and remember that there will be different rules even for the same product depending on the specific free trade agreement. And a change of tariff heading means that processing that changes the commodity code of the product from one heading to another. So for example, raw hides that have been manufactured into shoes will change the CN code, CN code the commodity code. And finally, you can use a com combination of the value added, the specific process, and the change of heading methods. So there is different options there in relation to the sufficiently worked. Just in terms of um, examples, by specific free trade agreements. So you can see two examples here. One relates to the EU-Canada free trade agreement. So an example is the cotton sewn thread. So the spinning of natural fibers um, or man-made fibers accompanied by spinning. So the e-manufacturer uses the non-originating natural fibers. The fibers are then spun into cotton sewing thread and that thread is under exported under CETA as EU originating. Then under the PEM convention, um, this is manufactured from yarn. So a skirt that was created from uh, non-originating yarn the yarn is woven into the fabric from which the skirts are made up, and then the skirts are exported under the PEM convention as EU originating. So you can see the idea in relation to the specific process that can allow you to um, qualify them as EU originating. Just in terms of insufficient processing then, so the previous slides covered what would be significant, and these are some examples of insufficient where non-originating material would not obtain the EU originating status. So examples of this include pre preserving operations, breaking up an assembly of packages and simply mixing the products, whether or not there are different kinds of products. And then the slaughter of animals doesn't have to change the origin, origin of the product. In terms of the, um, the impact as well, so from a lot of the detail in the last few slides relates to the technical definitions. And to put this in context and understand it, how it will be important in terms of context, from the 1st of January, UK goods will be considered as non-originating materials for the pur purposes of EU free trade agreements with other countries. So if you use a UK originating material in a manufacturing process and then export those goods outside of the EU, there are a number of, impl number of implications. So if you export to a third country where there is no free trade, trade agreement, then there will be no impact as the importer in the third country will not be claiming preferential treatment. However, if you export to a third country where there is an FTA, then you need to look carefully at the product specific rules of that particular agreement to see if a product will continue to qualify for the preferential treatment bearing in mind all the previous information we have discussed already in relation to tolerance, territoriality, sufficiently worked, et cetera. And the negotiations in relation to the duty and other issues are ongoing, as we know, between the EU and the UK, so we don't know what product-specific rules may apply from the 1st of January. It's an important point to note that is if, if a zero travel tariff agreement is reached, then the concepts we were talking about today will apply to trade with the UK where preference is being claimed. And that's an important point to note, I suppose, in relation to some of the topics that covered in, in the previous slides. Just in relation to, um, I've mentioned already that under each free trade agreement, um, they will include the concept of accumulation, which allows materials originating one partner country to be considered as originating in another partner country. Um, so for example, the CETA goods originating in Canada can be considered in the same way as goods 
for originating in the EU for the um, but the type of accumulation will differ depending on the agreement. Um, bilateral accumulation is the standard form of accumulation where there are only two partners to the FTA, and this is the basis which the ongoing EU EU well, UK negotiations are being discussed. And hopefully uh, in the next few weeks with more information related to that. I think there may be someone that's uh, um, just in relation to uh, further on accumulation, there's also diagonal and regional accumulation. I'll delete some that were in last night. More than two countries provided that they have yeah, free trade containing identical origin rules and provision for diagonal or regional accumulation between them. Yeah, so materials must be originating from economy. the countries participating in the diagonal accumulation. Sorry, next slide now. Um, just in relation to full accumulation then, it applies to the working and processing on non-originating materials. So the working or processing in the product specific rules can be carried out in the non-originating materials in the parties to the free trade agreement. Again, these are different types of accumulation, so it's it's a deep awareness of them. And um, it operates between the EU in this example, for example, and countries of the EEA or African Caribbean and Pacific countries. So I mentioned previously that origin always needs to be proven in order to claim the preferential treatment. And there are a few different ways of doing that as listed on the screen. The most recent free trade agreements allowed for the allow for the use of registered exporters electronic system the, the REC system and that is what is would be expected and will be used if an agreement is reached between the EU and the UK in terms of this so the REC system is the is used in the most recent free trade agreements and expected that it will be used in, in terms of any agreement with the UK as well and remember that if you're importing products and you want to claim the preference then your supplier and the partner country will need to provide the necessary proofs Whereas if you're an exporter, then you must provide the proofs so that your purchaser can claim the preference. So that's an important point to note in relation to the importing and the exporting. And then just in terms of the verification procedures, importers and exporters should keep documentary evidence for at least three years proving the origin of the goods. And customs authorities may request such proofs from importers and exporters under the terms of the free trade agreement. Uh, some examples of the documentary evidence uh, can include direct evidence of a process carried out by the exporter or supplier in their accounts or the bookkeeping records, documents proving the origin of the materials used in the production of the product, or documents proving the working or the processing of the materials. There's different um, different options available depending on the processing that was done, but it's it's important to remember that you do need to keep records and evidence of this uh, in, for, for three years. So it's important to remember that in terms of any free trade agreement when proving the origin. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to talk, I suppose, about the impact the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland will have from an origin perspective. But before I do, it's important to highlight the difference between the EU origin and EU status. So all goods in free circulation in the EU have an EU status regardless of their origin. This means that products can move freely within the EU once all customs formalities have been completed on the original import into the EU. The origin of the product then depends on all of the factors we discussed during the webinar already. And it's the origin that it's important to when considering preferential treatment. It's important to bear in mind that. And just in terms of the protocol, in simple terms, it allows goods in Northern or Northern Irish goods, sorry, to have union status, so that customs controls are not required for trade between Northern Ireland and Ireland and any other member state. However, because Northern Ireland will remain part of the UK customs territory, the Northern Irish products will have UK origin. So you need to be mindful of this if you use Northern Irish materials or component parts in any of your manufacturing processes. Where you only sell your final product within the EU, there will be no impact in your trade. And we do not yet know what the impact will be if you sell your final product to the UK as negotiations are still ongoing in relation to the free trade agreement. And then when you sell your product to third country, with which the EU has a free trade agreement, there can be implications. And that's something to bear in mind. And it's what we discussed in relation to the different free trade agreements have different rules. So it's be aware of that and be aware of the impact that the Northern Irish originating goods may have. So this slide, I suppose, that, that goes more into detail in relation to the effect the protocol can have from an origin perspective. Um, it's prudent for importers and exporters to examine if the Northern Irish goods being used as inputs to products affects the ability for preference to be claimed under other free trade agreements. So if you're producing a product in Ireland uh, and has inputs from Northern Ireland and you are exporting to countries that have a free trade agreement with the EU you need to bear this in mind. So if you use Northern origin, sorry, if you use Northern Irish originating materials or any Northern Irish processing in the manufacturing process, and again, if you export those goods, you need to look carefully at the product specific rules of that particular agreement to see if your product will continue to qualify for the preferential treatment, bearing in mind all the information that we've already discussed and we went through, again, in terms of tolerance, territoriality, sufficiently worked. And if you export to a third country where no FTA 
then there'll be no impact as the import of the third country will not be claiming preferential treatment and will not need the proofs of origin as such. So that's the key point to remember that if you're exporting to countries that have an FTA, there is an impact. If they, if they don't have an FTA with the EU, there, there is no impact in relation to that. So just one last principle I want to explain before I, I wrap up, and that's accounting segregation. Um, it's, again, it's a technical, I suppose, concept. Um, it allows fungible, so this means it's identical or interchangeable originating or, and non-originating materials to be stored together without the originating material losing its origin. So not all, all FTAs include this provision, and where it's included, you may need an authorization from revenue. You must also be able to show that you're storing the originating and non-originating materials separately, and this may be, which would be costly, or sorry, that you must need to show that it will be costly or difficult to store them separately. So it's just a concept to be aware of. Um, it, again, it depends on the terms of the free trade agreement with the UK. And I suppose as a result of the accounting segregation, you can use the originating and non-originating materials interchangeably. However, you must uh, maintain detailed records in relation to your stock management systems to show that you have not produced any more originating products than you would have produced if you had um, used only the originating materials. So it's, it's a bit technical in relation to those details. It applies to certain products and um, the detail, in, I suppose, in this presentation is, is at a technical level, and my colleague Kevin will go through a bit more information in relation to this for more practical uh, scenarios and examples from a Department of Agriculture point of view. So I thank you for listening. Again, but there are the contact details in relation if you want to specifically question revenue on, on relation to anything on origin value or valuation, or in relation to any Brexit queries that you have, you can contact those details. So I now pass you over to my colleague Kevin. I'll just uh, quickly come in there first, if you don't mind, uh, Ray, and thank you very much for that. Uh, we did get one question, uh, and I'll just direct that to you now, if you don't mind. Um, did you skip over diagonal accumulation uh, was uh, one of the questions that came in. Uh, I don't know if that means anything to you. Uh, it doesn't mean a huge amount to me. Sorry, Tom, I didn't catch any of that. Uh, the sound went very bad. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just say it again. We did have one question. Someone was asking whether or not you had touched on diagonal accumulation or not uh, during your presentation, or is that a, a concept that you hadn't used? Yeah, sorry, it was in the presentation. I actually spoke about it and hadn't the slide up, and I skipped the slide itself, so they might have seen it. But I did speak about it, and the slide went moved on. I, I was, it was, um, there was a coverage of the diagonal accumulation before the full accumulation. Okay, well, perhaps we we might make the slides available then uh, afterwards as oh, yeah. well, so that uh, yeah, people can no see. Them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Well, then, in that case, then uh, I will hand over to Kevin, and uh, Kevin Foley Friel will take us through the uh, Department of Agriculture, Food, and the Marine aspects of uh, rules of origin. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so I suppose like revenue has provided a really comprehensive overview of rules origin, how they work, um, as well as the challenges Brexit poses in this area. I suppose this, this part of the webinar will focus in on some of the specific rules origin that apply to agri-food goods and the implications the end of the transition period will have on accessing different EU FTAs. I suppose if you're trading outside of the EU, then this is something you should be prepared for from the 1st of January. In particular, if you import goods from the UK, and that includes Northern Ireland, or if you import goods from outside the EU and export to the UK, then you need to be need to prepare for these changes. Um, as we've seen from Revenue's presentation, this is a highly technical area, and the rules that apply to your goods will be very specific to you and your business processes. It will be prudent in terms of preparing for the end of the transition period to be familiar with the specific product rules that apply to your goods. If you're exporting to an existing market, these are already available. If you're exporting to the UK using, <clears throat> excuse me, using inputs from outside the EU, then I suggest looking at some of the more recent EU FTAs like CETA to get a sense of what might be required, but just be aware that those negotiations are still ongoing. I suppose the EU has uh, free trade agreements with around 70 different countries, many of which have highly individualized rules origin for different products. It's important to keep in mind that while Brexit will impact on how goods will access the, those free trade agreements, those agreements have already been agreed, some for quite some time and there is no realistic prospect of them being renegotiated between now and the end of the transition period. The Commission have been very clear that they will not reopen existing agreements. Um, that said, there are some free trade agreements currently being negotiated, including with Australia, New Zealand, the US, and of course the UK, and the rules for those agreements are not yet fully determined. Um, the EU-UK free trade agreement is certainly very important. Those negotiations remain ongoing. 
Um, if an FTA is agreed between the EU and the UK, then that too will have its own specific set of product-specific rules. Those rules will have to be complied with in order to access the preferential rate in uh, EU-UK FTA. Um, as I said, we don't have sight of those rules yet, but we will be looking very closely at them when they are released. You're probably kind of sick of hearing of it at this point, but I don't think anyone can reiterate enough that from 1st of January 2021, the UK will be treated as a third country, just like the US, Australia, and Canada. There are changes in how trade will work going forward, and the rules are a gentleman is vital to prepare for um, in terms of availing of any FTA that is agreed between the EU and the UK. And the agri-food sector, those free trade agreements are vital. Agri-food products are typically heavily protected, and market access for agri-food products is typically severely constrained in the absence of an FTA. The department has conducted an analysis of the potential implications of a no-deal Brexit, including the imposition of tariffs on Irish agri-food exports. We're estimating an effective tariff rate of around 72% on beef exports to the UK and around 40% in dairy exports to the UK. It varies by commodity with tariffs on certain products significantly higher than those figures. It applies to imports too, with uh, estimates in for um, imports of tariffs around 66% on beef and 57% on dairy. It's important to remember that the reduced tariff rate available in the FTA only applies if you can comply with the rules of origin. This is particularly important for agri-food goods as, as the product specific rules in those commodities tend to be quite strict. They usually require that the product is wholly originating or have limited non-originating material. As many of you are probably aware, this is particularly problematic for the dairy sector, which sources around 800 million litres of milk per annum from Northern Ireland. This milk is not considered originating within the EU for the purposes of complying with the rules of origin. Ireland's also effectively entirely reliant on the UK for our import of flour. We've imported 141,000 tonnes of flour of common wheat and spelt and 87,000 tonnes of durum wheat flour in 2019. If you're using these imported products and exports, which you're sending outside the EU, then you have to be very careful that you can, can still comply with the relevant product-specific rule if you intend to availing of the preferential tariff rate in those FTAs. Uh, so I think we've seen from Revenue's presentation, rules of origin are quite complicated, nuanced, and specific to product and FTA. Fortunately, at least in terms of preparing and understanding for the practical implications on the agri-food side, there does tend to be a little less variation in, in many of the key rules. We look at the first couple of chapters of the combined nomenclature uh, covering live animals as well as meat and fish, chapters one, two, and three, you'll see that there is very limited variation for these rules in the EU's FTAs. All these products must be wholly obtained from within the EU in order to avail of the reduced tariff rate the EU has agreed for that third country. You'll see this common approach on the product-specific rules for these products in the EU's FTAs with Canada, Singapore, South Africa, and others. Chapters four and five tend to be broadly the same as well across FTAs, but there, there is a little more variation in that, and we will cover an example on dairy in particular shortly. Once you start looking at some of the more processed goods, though, you'll start to see that there's significantly more variation in the product-specific rule between FTAs, and that's uh, in particular where you'll have to pay attention. Sorry, the uh, slides skipped there a little. I suppose the this is here is just a small table of some of the key Irish agri-food exports um, to countries with which the EU has an FTA in uh, 2019. You can see already there's some fairly common themes in most of the applicable rules origin for common agri-food exports. Um, the imports used to produce cheddar and butter need to be wholly obtained no matter where you send it. Same is true of beef and fish. Uh, whiskey, uh, as you can see there, is, is kind of an interesting one. Uh, whiskey to Canada has a, a certain rule there. You can see it uh, change from any other heading outside this group except from heading 2204. But the exact same product sent to South Africa will have a very different rule. Um, uh, it's also not listed on this table. What you'll find is that the tariffs that apply on these products also varies quite a bit. Uh, if we stick with the, the, Canada, the Irish whiskey to Canada and South Africa example, the percentage rate that uh, the tariff rate that Canada imposes on Irish whiskey is different to the tariff rate imposed by South Africa. And again, just, just to reiterate that in the context of agri-food exports, um, the tariff rate tends to be quite high. Uh, just for kind of maybe a sense of uh, context, Irish agri-food exports in 2019 were around 14.5 billion and about a billion of that went to EU FTA partner countries. Exports to the UK are around 5.5 billion. And I suppose it's maybe just worth taking a step here and um, 
just pointing out that essentially overnight the profile of Irish agri-food trade will change overnight from one dominated by movements within the single market, in single market even, sorry, to a major portion of that trade going to um, outside the EU. It's a fairly significant and abrupt change. That's why the Department of the Whole Government response is so focused on preparedness and why rules origin are, um, are receiving such attention from the Department and from our uh, colleagues in the revenue. Just uh, following on from that table, I thought it might be helpful to look at a couple of specific practical examples. Um, fresher chilled boneless bovine meat is a good place to start. We exported about 23 million worth of beef to Switzerland in 2019. As we've discussed already, to avail the reduced tariff rate uh, for that product, you have to comply with the relevant product-specific rule. In this case, the, the rule is that the animal or animal product used to make the final export was wholly originating within the EU. Key thing to note here is, just as uh, Ray has mentioned in his, his part of the presentation, that Northern Ireland does not count as part of the EU for the purposes of um, determining origin. It's also worth pointing out that the tariff applied on beef products tends to be quite high. The EU's tariff on uh, on this product from a, a, a third country, uh, essentially a country that doesn't have a special di dispensation from the main tariff rates that the UA EU imposes, is 12.8% of the value of the product, plus a further €303.40 per 100 kilograms. That's uh, essentially prohibitive. And that's why it's so important that um, industry is aware of the uh, the customs rules origin, how to comply with them, and ensure that they uh, don't fall foul to, to some of these tariff rates that can be avoided. Cheddar is another key export to, to have a look at. Uh, I suppose this is one of our major dairy exports to um, the existing EU FTA con partner countries. In 2019, Irish cheddar exports to uh, uh, FTA partner countries included 43 million to Japan, and almost 40 million to Algeria, another 18 million to Egypt. The product specific rule in each of these cases is the exact same, that the milk used to make that cheddar must be wholly originating. As we spoke about very briefly earlier, this is likely to be particularly problematic given the amount of milk imported from Northern Ireland, which will not be part of the EU customs territory after the end of the transition period. Uh, there, there are no particularly good solutions to this problem, especially where production plants mix milk from both Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, Ray spoke about county segregation in his presentation, which allows for fungible material, which would include milk, to be tracked in inventory management systems, even if originating and non-originating milk was physically mixed as part of the production process. This process might not, uh, I suppose, accounting segregation may not be suitable for all businesses, but certainly something you should explore if you uh, import milk from Northern Ireland. Uh, I suppose just maybe one one final example to talk about is um, on spirit drinks uh, and Irish whiskey in particular. Um, as mentioned earlier, the product specific rule for this more processed product was very little more across FDAs than you would ordinarily see in some of the other key agri-food exports that, um, that we'd send from Ireland. Uh, some of the specific detail relevant to the sector has already been covered by uh, industry analysis conducted by Drinks Ireland in June of this year. It's worth flagging that uh, even though the Irish whiskey geographic indicator will continue from 1 January 2021, the rules of origin which uh, will affect Irish whiskey made in Ireland, Irish whiskey made in Northern Ireland, and Irish whiskey made with production processes and imports from across the Ireland, it'll, it'll impact them in different ways. Um, Irish whiskey produced in Ireland will avail of EU FTAs, the same GI produced in Northern Ireland of the UK FTAs, and mixed GI product uh, may be able to avail of one or the other, depending on the exact production process. Um, it's, it's just like with milk from Northern Ireland, the complication here is that the protocol sets the customs territory in Northern Ireland uh, as the UK. The added complication is that the system for geographic indicators and customs rules origin here are essentially entirely separate. To the point where I note that the CN code referred to in the slide 22083082 uh, covers Irish whiskey, but it also covers other whiskies. Um, that's that is something just to, to keep in mind, particularly for the spirits drink sector. Um, the final point I might want to just draw your attention to is um, is that what we're talking about here, I suppose, is rules origin. And rules origin speak to tariffs and whether or not you can avail the reduced tariff rate uh, available in FTA with partner country if one exists. Uh, there's another side to this, though, from an agri-food perspective in particular. Export health certificates have a number of attestations on them, and these can sometimes require an indication of the origin commodity. 
this tends to be handled differently to customs rules origin. If the export health certificate requires an education origin and your product cannot comply with it, then the export health certificate won't be issued. If the certificate isn't issued, you don't even get to the point where you're looking at tariffs. The product isn't allowed entered into the into that country. Just like customs rules origin, the particular requirements for export health certificates vary by product and country. Most export health certificates for dairy products, for instance, do not require an indication of origin, but a few do. Just two examples, Algeria requires that milk originates in either Ireland or Northern Ireland, while South Africa requires that the milk originates in the EU or other stated countries. If your product requires an export health certificate, then in addition to checking how you may need to adapt to customs rules origin changes from 1 January, you'll be prudent to consider your export health certificates in more detail as well to ensure that there's no complication arising there. Uh, and just a couple of steps maybe just to uh, leave you with to consider at the end of this webinar. If you haven't already, it, it is vital to consider your entire supply chain and ensure you're aware of any implications that might be posed in terms of rules origin or market access issues from 1 January. You know, time, time is short, but there is still time to make a final necessary preparations. And maybe just the last point to, to keep in mind is that these are highly technical areas that have the potential to stifle trade. We're in a very strange position here in that barriers to trade are being introduced rather than being reduced. Uh, things will change from 1 January and it'll become more expensive, more complicated, more onerous to trade. The department, and I think I can speak for our colleagues in revenue here as well, and indeed across the government, there are specialists and technical experts available and willing to help, and you should definitely take advantage of that expertise when preparing. And just in that context, you'll see that the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines Brexit helpline phone number is on the screen there, along with the Brexit uh, email address. And you can um, reach out to us if you're uh, looking for any advice. Thanks. OK, thank you very much for that, Kevin. Um, we just have one query in now. Um, and I'm not really sure where to direct this one because it's, it's quite a broad, it's a, it's a broad one. Given the clear impact of Brexit, the impact on Northern Ireland origin agri-products used in Ireland, will revenue or the government look at initiatives to increase Republic of Ireland agri-output to meet demand for use in manufacturing for exports under the free trade agreement to avoid manufacturing organisations migrating to mainland EU to avail of access to the EU um, agri-products? Um, I don't know if either one of you, Francis, taking that. That seems to me like it's uh, it's something that will need a, a little bit more uh, analysis of, I suppose, before we really know whether that's necessary. I can give a brief. It's not really revenue, but it's just in terms of what we're seeing from webinars we've been on or hearing that what we've been on is that there is business opportunities, and we do expect that. Obviously, there's a lot of challenges and some of the stuff that we went through there today is very challenging for a lot of businesses, but there is opportunities maybe to produce more in Ireland and businesses would look at that. And obviously, Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment would be one of the agencies or one of the departments and their agencies will be encouraging businesses to look to look at those opportunities. So the likes of a local enterprise office, if you're if you're thinking about it, maybe contact them. They, they will they will look at those export or those markets and those opportunities. So it's something to look at. It is an opportunity maybe there to to use some of the trade that is already in Northern Ireland and do it in Ireland. I, I think it's that's a very good point. And uh, I also think it's reasonable to say that uh, that the government and the various agencies have also been fairly quick to react to opportunities over the last number of years with the likes of Enterprise Ireland, Board Bia, and so on and so forth. We're continually looking for new markets, whether they're at home or abroad. So. Uh, I suspect that you probably will see initiatives, but as I had said, we'll actually need to see what the initial impact is before we see what the opportunities are. Uh, we have another one coming in, which is what will happen to the companies that had the authorized exporter status under the EU uh, in the case of a, a free trade agreement? Its status will remain or they'll need authorization to be able to have the origin, for instance, in the invoice. Is that... Um, does that jump out to either one of you as being something you can take? I'm not sure now. The authorized exporter. Yeah, is uh, is that a specific status? Authorized exporter. I'm not sure, Patricia or Jerry, would it be? Sorry, my colleagues from uh, Origin section are on the call as well, so they may be able to. 
Uh, Ray, if I can answer that, yeah. Yep. Can you hear me? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, the authorised exporter is an authorisation to be able to declare that, that the goods have the origin. And um, if you are using UK or Northern Ireland products in processing, you will need to actually let us know that the, the, um, the goods going into the process have changed so that we can look at your authorization and just see if it needs to be changed or amended or if it doesn't apply anymore. But the likelihood is that it just needs to be changed or amended. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we don't appear to have uh, any more questions at the moment. I suppose uh, people have been given the relevant email addresses, so if they have specific queries, they can direct them either to Revenue or to ourselves here at the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Um, I suppose it just remains for me to thank you all for attending today and also to thank our speakers, uh, Ray Ryan and Kevin foley Creel, and also Ray's colleagues from Revenue for their, um, their kind uh, help in terms of answering the questions. We will have a, a link up to this on our YouTube channel within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. So if anyone wants to watch it back, they'll be able to do that there. So thank you very much. Uh, we will have a continuing series of webinars uh, coming through next week. We will have export certification in relation to uh, plant and animal products on several of the days next week. If you look out on our website, and our social media channels. So uh, thank you very much and thank you for attending. Okay, thank you.